We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. I think we are live. Hi, Sandra. Um, this is Elisabeth from the room. <laughs> and yes, Thomas also joining. So I'll hand this over to him. Oh, wonderful to see you, Elisabeth, too. So I think you can help him because I heard that Thomas had a uh, has overstressed his voice last night. So I think he will be very happy if you help him out with some voice, basically. All right, all right, okay. Okay. Um, anyway, um, we are a small group, but from my own experience, I can say that um, Possibly a lot of people are watching the stream because for some reasons that's much easier to join a session instead of logging into rooms. So we have to expect that there are quite a number of people that we don't see neither in the room in Katowice nor in our Zoom room, but um, they will be following us. And I would like to welcome everyone, uh, people in Katowice. And I must say, it's really sad um, that uh, speaking personally, I cannot be with you because the secretariat was really uh, set to travel. We uh, prepared everything, but the situation, particularly in our region of Germany, is so badly that we have to um, be doubtful if we get a bed in hospital, if, if we get an infection. And in these circumstances, um, Rainer and myself, we decided not to go. Um, but it's, it's a strange situation to see colleagues in Katowice and uh, yeah, we're actually not able to be there as well. Anyhow, um, I think it's a really good experience to try out uh, this virtual, uh, sorry, this hybrid format, um, which is sort of new for all of us, uh, new in the, in the respect that we have to see how good people in the virtual world can connect with those being on site. And uh, I would suggest uh, this session is uh, merely a very informal session, a networking session. Everyone should just uh, raise the voice as you think. We would like to discuss with you um, how uh, we organize Eurodic in the future. We could also have a short conversation on the UN uh, leadership panel that uh, has recently been uh, announced or a call for nomination was announced. And to warm up the discussion a little bit, um, would like to start with uh, introducing again our uh, publications. Um, to the history of this publication, it was decided in 2018, which was exactly 10 years after Eurodic was founded, that we should basically somehow capture um, the, how the discussion emerged on certain issues uh, over, the, over a decade. I think the last decade in particular was uh, mirrored a lot of um, change, interruption, disruption in, in our society and how we use ICT and uh, um, the discussion uh, over the 10 years and certain issues changed. There was sometimes even a, a paradigm shift and we wanted to uh, capture this um, change, the decade of change basically, that's also why we call it uh, a decade of change and we are looking into our clusters, um, knowing that the clusters are sometimes cross-cutting, but we somehow have to organize it. So we decided to organize it in the same way as we still organize the Eurodic meetings, but um, we uh, organize session on certain clusters that have a focus on media and content or focus on internet governance or focus on security and crime. And um, the first uh, publication and we were very lucky that we have a journalist among our members, which is Udyu Lenzi Puro, and uh, he volunteered to do the first publication on media and content. And um, just to po point you um, where you can find this publication, I share my screen with you for that moment. 
So you can see here on the Eurodic website, Eurodic Board about uh, publications, and there you will find a PDF download for the two already finished publications. And it's worth noting that um, uh, the European Commission was very uh, supportive, also financially, to uh, organize this and, and to, to bring these publications uh, on, on its way. A third publication is already underway, which is in the capable hands of Mark Pavel. Um, this will look into the cluster of internet governance. I see Mark is also with us. And the uh, second publication uh, was uh, the author was uh, Tatiana Tropina, also Eurodic member. I see she just joined us, uh, interrupting her teaching <laughs> today. Thank you, Tanya. And um, the aim would be that we give the floor to the authors, um, but also to those who dedicated the foreword, because we are very, very lucky to have, uh, or that we could gain quite important people to write the foreword to our publications, people that are partners of Eurodic, that are committed to Eurodic, and for media and content, it was the Director General of the European Broadcasting Union, Noel Kuran. Unfortunately, he cannot be with us, but his colleague Nicola Frank is with us. And for the security and crime publication, we are very lucky to have Marina Kaljuran. Nowadays, she is a member of the European Parliament, but at the time when Eurodic uh, came to Tallinn, she was the Minister of Foreign Affairs for a while. And uh, she basically made it possible uh, to have Eurodic in, in Estonia. So I suggest we start uh, with uh, those who were organizing uh, the, the publication itself. So Uri, he took the pen. He was the volunteer, the guinea pig uh, to, to start this uh, initiative. Uri, Please walk us a little bit uh, through that publication, what people can find in there, and um, we will then hand over to Nicola Frank as the organization that dedicated the foreword. We do the same for the second publication. We might also touch upon the third one, and then let's have a look uh, what we are going to do with the rest of the time. We might look into our virtual meeting reports from the years 2020 and 2021 and draw our conclusions on what we are going to do uh, next year in hopefully Trieste. So Uriu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, this is Uriel Lanzipura speaking. Uh, yeah, the uh, decade of change. Uh, I think that we, uh, we wanted to start that series because it was really a, a decade, 10 years, or a little bit more than 10 years actually, of uh, what I would call transformative chains of the internet and everything connected related to the internet. So a tremendous progress on all possible areas, but at the same time, a sobering experience. There was a lot of hype about the internet in the beginning, in the beginning of this millennium. And uh, somehow the hype has cooled off the opportunities uh, have been turning into challenges, hopes turning into fears. And uh, you could use the American saying that the future ain't what it used to be. And, and media was uh, certainly one of the areas hit by this perfect storm uh, uh, so that uh, it was quite natural that, that media was, was, was uh, selected as the first one. Um, the, uh, each Eurodig and each IGF, uh, for that matter, is like a snapshot, a freeze frame of a very fast development. Uh, and uh, so when we put these snapshots, these freeze frames over 10 years or 11 years together, I, I, I think we can see how the story sort of keeps building up. Uh, and of course, when it comes to media and content, what was the story? Of course, the story was the unstoppable ascent of the platforms of social media, of uh, 
user-generated content, as it was called in the beginning. Um, uh, maybe I should, I, I don't know. I think that we covered that story pretty well from the beginning. Maybe I should be recused from commenting on this because I was involved in it, but, but I still think that it was, it was a, a story well covered. Uh, in, uh, I'm just browsing the publication and just uh, trying to uh, relate a few highlights. Uh, in Geneva 2009, that was the second Eurodic, and uh, one of the uh, one of the topics was Internet of 2020, future services, future challenges. So uh, in 2008, we wanted to we tried to see 12 years ahead, and this is what we said about social media uh, in in 2008. Social net networks will likely gain an important important, sorry, gain in importance. Facebook style networks may develop towards virtual face rooms where friends meet and spend time together, thereby adding pressure on legislation and rules to become more technology neutral and modern. Twitter like services could become more prominent. Peer filtering and peer reviewing uh, could become more important. A stable legal framework which addressing, addresses human rights, such as the right to privacy, should be implemented in order to, in particular, to avoid or reduce the risk of civil society losing confidence in new technology possibilities. So interesting that this was 2008. Uh, uh, <laughs> prophesizing what social media, social networks are going to go to be. Uh, there, ever since the social media was uh, part of our media and content uh, palette uh, at these meetings in Madrid 2010, we talked about liability and uh, blocking of content, Belgrade uh, 2011. That was the time of Arab Spring and great hopes that, that the internet would be a tool for democracy. And uh, so the title of our session was Internet for Democracy, Tool or Trap or What? Because there was also there were also affairs that internet was not only tool for democracy, but also for, for those who are against democracy. Uh, Lisbon 2013, who makes money with content? Who should pay for content? That was the focus at that time. Uh, in, uh, in Sofia uh, 2015, media in the digital age. And uh, what we said was that the customization of information delivery had a narrowing effect, which can allow global internet companies to become gatekeepers for users. So uh, in a way, we were happy that we there was a means, there were means to go past and go <laughs> over the gatekeepers that we used to have. And, and now we were having new gatekeepers coming up. In Brussels 2016, uh, the title was Content is the King Revisited. What we did was we took the uh, took the article by Bill Gates uh, 20 years before, uh, and uh, which was uh, where he said that content is where uh, I expect much of the real money will be made on the internet, just as it was in broadcasting. And in Brussels 2016, we, we tried to see whether that is still true, uh, and of course we had to realize that uh, that uh, where is the king now? Is it a platform? Is it uh, advertisers or or what? Uh, and also we were talking about gatekeepers. Do we need gatekeepers back, or should some hierarchy be imposed on the information deluge? More information doesn't lead to better informed people. Uh, and so on and so forth. In Belize, uh, we talked about uh, information. 
actually, yeah, Tallinn. What we had in, 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 in Tallinn, we were meeting 2017 in a situation where Estonia had been first has uh, had first hand experience of being targeted by sustained and, and concentrated digital attacks. Uh, and uh, also 2017, of course, the word of the year was uh, post truth, fake news, that was very much in the focus in our at our meeting in, in Tallinn 2017. In, in Twilis next year, we were talking about information disorder. That is to say, not only fake news as such, but I mean, various other, other, other things that, that uh, qualify to be called information disorder as such. In HUG, tackling on online harms, a regulatory minefield. In HARC, the, the emphasis was the focus on what was on, on what governments were planning to do uh, to, uh, to tackle this disorder. We also had a, a very interesting uh, game, actually, a play Fending of Trolls Journalists in Defense of Democracy where we learned to tackle fake news by producing fake news ourselves in this game. And finally, we had the virtual, a couple of virtual, virtual uh, uh, Euro leagues. Uh, the, the first one, uh, social media opportunities, rights and responsibilities. And at that time, of course, 2020, uh, COVID-19 was a new thing, and we were focusing, among other things, on what WHO called infodemic, that is to say how COVID-19 uh, played in social media and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I'll stop here, and uh, any questions, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a nice walk through 10 years of uh, discussion on media and content. Um, please uh, allow me to give the floor first to Tanya, since I just learned she has to continue teaching in like uh, 10 minutes. So um, it's not ideal. I know we can't get questions now. We can't continue the first brochure. But um, maybe, Tanya, you can immediately follow up on uh, Urius. Uh, review on his category media and content because you did the same for the category security and crime. Tanya, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra, and thanks uh, for, for giving me the floor. And sorry, everybody, I really have to teach very soon and I will have to run. Um, thanks to you. And first of all, I want to thank Sandra and European Commission and Euridic for enabling me to uh, give this report to the community and, and, to, and to provide the overview of these discussions. If you look at the cybersecurity discussions development at Euridig, you can see from this report that this is quite a journey. And we can, we can separate this cybersecurity discussion journey into three parts. It started with the first Eurodig in 2008, when the community in their discussion, in its discussion, was reacting to the most pressing cybersecurity issues and creating, enabling the space for dialogue. And it went until 2014. Um, and and, and the, the subjects of the discussions were always multi-stakeholder oriented and they were um, focusing on something that was happening immediately. Like for example, access to data in the cloud or, or data protection or child protection. So it was, it was, they were great discussions. But then again, there were two slight problems with them. Uh, the one problem was that some of the members of the community apparently perceived it as too technical, for example, or too legal, or, 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 or they were reacting to immediate problems, but there was no structured discussion, but then Euridig was able to channel all these. And from the year 2015 to 2017, you can definitely see that the Euridig matured so much that uh, cybersecurity was perceived as everybody's concern. And in addition to reacting and discussing immediate problems, the concept of cybersecurity sessions at Euridig was to 
build the capacity not only to address cybersecurity problems, but also build the capacity to discuss, to involve everybody, to create this space for dialogue and getting stakeholders involved into this debate. And this is how Eurodig moved to part three, to stage three with the cybersecurity discussion, because from the year 2018, every time Eurodig happened, the security issues, the cybersecurity issues were placed in European content, but they were always global issues like responsible state behavior, private actors as norm setters, um, COVID related concerns, global health crisis related concerns, European regulation on cybersecurity and new proposals. So there is a bucket of problems, global problems that has manifestations on the European level. And when you see how these discussions developed. When you go through this report, I actually found it quite fascinating when I wrote it to trade these discussions, to look at them, to see how stakeholder positions changed and how the involvement and engagement of stakeholders in discussion changed. And what I want to say is that I do hope that when you look at this report, you will share my fascination. You don't have to go through all the recordings and all the transcripts. You have everything in one place. And not only you have the report, you also have a summary where you can trace everything. And just then, you know, tackle it where you want to tackle. And this is all from me. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, Nicola, that, that I, took, I, I took the floor first. I hope you will forgive me. And Sandra and all, thank you so much. I will, I will remain for another five minutes and then I will, I, I will run. Nice okay. to see you all. Thank you very much, Tanya. So since um, you have to run in five minutes, let's ask the audience and uh, Elizabeth and Thomas, please help me also with the audience in the room if there are any questions or comments to Tanya's intervention, only Tanya for the moment, to give her uh, the chance to still reply on it. See, we we'll make a lot of exceptions for you, Tanya, today. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Um, welcome here from uh, Katowice. Um, we have about 10 to 15 people in the room, so if you want to have, or want to say something, or ask something, if you have questions or comments to Tanya's report, then come on the mic here, and then we'll signal that um, there would be some questions, but for the time being, it does not seem to be the case. I feel very unloved, everybody. <laughs> okay, I also don't so see Take it as a sign of agreement and we're all happy and we thank you a thousand times and uh, happy to, to have you do this work. Thanks. There are also no hands raised in the in the Zoom chat. So then let's uh, hand over to Nicola. Nicola, um, I invite you to give your view of the EBU that dedicated the foreword to the first publication, which basically was a really good move because to have a foreword on that high level uh, made it easier to get the high level foreword on for the others too. So thanks again in, in this respect for being so cooperative. Hello, and, and thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation also and organizing this event. It's been a pleasure, of course, uh, for Noel Curran to, to, give, to, to provide this forward. I mean, we've been a partner of Eurodic actually from the start. And, and uh, because we always thought, you know, media issues need to be discussed in, in the context of internet, internet governance and how you deal, uh, how you give access to content and, and all these questions are, have been important from the start. We actually hosted a Eurodic event in 2009 in Geneva. So this was also a sign to, to demonstrate that we are really committed to be a partner of this important initiative. And as I said, I mean, freedom of expression, free and independent media, media policies have always been on the agenda of all. And we heard from you, you what, what were the subjects. And it's really interesting. Thank you also again for this report, Elio, to take us. It, it's a good. Um, demonstration of how, how things have changed huh? and um, we could not predict how it would develop but some predictions were already made which we heard just now from you which is really interesting. Now for media and Irio says this, this has really been a shake-up it has been a perfect storm over all these years things have really changed um, but not only for the media but also for the users of the internet of course huh? because that is really the interaction between what is offered on the internet on the platforms and how the users access to it and what they do with it. Um, back in 2008, 2009, 
the big, big platforms were not what they are today. We know that, of course. Uh, we discussed rather issues in the beginning about connectivity, also how you really everybody has access to internet and has access to, to what is offered. But, and access to content and quality diversity was already an issue. And I think from the start, we had the issue, we had the issue about trust and democracy. So what can the internet really provide uh, in terms of uh, the democratic debate and discussion. But this is only possible, of course, if people can trust what they see. So nowadays, unfortunately, platforms determine a lot of what people see and when. And this is based on their decisions, on their algorithms, on their content recommendation systems, community standards, and terms and conditions. They have really developed into a gatekeeper position imposing their choices on audiences. And as I said, it's really about trust and democracy. How can platform users trust what they see? How can they make informed decisions in this context? Um, the platforms unfortunately really in interfere with content. And now we have, as you know, we have this discussion at the European level about the DSA. And, and we think that some of the issues can be addressed there, that platforms do not interfere with media content because it's already regulated and um, we don't want them to make the decisions about what should be on the media, what should be provided by media providers. Now, I think safeguards are necessary for this behavior. And, but trust is also about, for example, brand attribution and transparency of algorithmic decisions. So if people don't know what they see, where this, what the source is, they cannot decide whether they can trust or not. So these are discussions we're having now, very importantly at European level. So we hope that this will be addressed. Um, and uh, all this the whole discussion about democracy and trust also translated into an event which we organized at Eurodic this year. And this very much looked um, uh, at how create to create a, a trusted public sphere for media, but also beyond, uh, which offers choice to users and which counters this and misinformation, because this is, of course, as we heard also from Ilio, the big issue, and it's been for a while. Uh, we discussed also policies necessary to curb the excessive power of tech giants and presented some concrete projects. And we were very proud to present uh, a new project the EBU has developed um, uh, during the pandemic, actually, and it's an online news project, which is called A European Perspective, and it leverages uh, the capabilities of artificial intelligence uh, and for automated translations and offers actually news from EBU members across Europe to their audience and in their own language. We have now 11 members participating in this project. And since it started, it was launched actually in July this year. This year we had already more than 23.5 million views actually on this news. So there is a real interest and uh, um, this kind of trusted sphere um, is really something people want to look at uh, and, and they want to have access to. Uh, yeah, we, there were a couple of messages, of course, which came out of this event, uh, and one of them was that this it's important to create these trusted European media spaces or trusted spheres, that the DSA and DMA are, are really opportunities to address the difficult uh, uh, um, uh, circumstances we have currently now. And then, of course, again, multi-stakeholder approach is really crucial. Uh, and that's very clear because, and in the multi-stakeholder approach, also we address the platforms who have a big stake, at, as I, I explained at the beginning. Uh, so um, it showed again that the Eurodig, also IGF, of course, are extremely important for us to discuss these issues. And over the years, as Irio, Irio has really uh, demonstrated very well in his report, I mean, it's always been um media media and media freedom and and democracy and trust have always been uh, important subjects and we hope that we will continue these discussions and unfortunately or maybe fortunately luckily we don't know how a digital transformation is going to develop 
um, we have seen during the pandemic that sometimes developments can be very fast. And I mean, digital transformation has been giving a push, of course, by these uh, developments in a good way. But uh, now we are all here online instead of meeting in a real network event, which would be nicer, of course. But it has also helped to bring a lot of people online, maybe who didn't use the internet so much and, and all the online things. So we don't know how it's going to develop, but what is sure is that this multi-stakeholder dialogue will continue to be extremely important and Eurodic is, is a wonderful initiative and platform to do so. So thank you very much again uh, for this cooperation and we are a committed partner of this initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. And um, let me thank you and IBU um, for being such a great cooperation partner over the uh, past decade. And um, I'm pretty sure that uh, the content and media issue will not leave us any soon. Uh, just the opposite. We will be curious to learn about how this uh, European sphere, this trusted platform will evolve. And I'm pretty sure that will be on our agenda for the next time um, as well. So without further ado, Marina, we are very happy to have you here as well um, as a truly expert for uh, security and crime. Uh, Marina, you were so kind and you dedicated the forward to our second brochure that was a real honor. And uh, I would like to invite you to say a few words um, from your perspective as uh, now legislator, but formerly governmental representative on uh, a development uh, over a decade in this field. Marina, the floor is yours. Uh, Sandra, thank you so much. Uh, and it's so good to see so many old friends and uh, new new friends on the, on the stage and on the screen. I'm back from Katowice. I returned late yesterday and Thomas, good to see you. You're still in Katowice, as I can see. And Uriel, I don't know if you remember, but we used to meet each other last century when I was posted to Finland, and you are very well loved and respected, not only in the Eurodic community, but especially in Estonia. So thank you so much for everything you have done so far. Yes, I can say it proudly and openly. I'm a fan of Eurodic, and I've been to Eurodic in different capacities. Uh, as a foreign minister, as undersecretary, as the chair of the Global Commission. So I think I know and appreciate how Eurodig works. I can say the same about IGF. I'm also a fan of cybersecurity because, well, my, my, my connection to cyber and digital affairs started in 2007 when I was Estonian ambassador to Russia. My country fell under cyber attacks and being lawyer by education, I had to learn in 10, 15 minutes what to do those attacks mean and start explaining it to the international community. So cybersecurity is also part of my life. So when Tatiana and Sandra approached me and asked to write a forward, I couldn't say no. And I did not want to say no because all the nice things and all the nice people came together. Uh, I, I listened many times to Tatiana, who I read her analysis. She was an expert uh, to whom we also listened uh, when I was chairing the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace. So she wasn't somebody I didn't know. I knew her well, I knew well her work, and I was sure that this book will be something special. And I would argue that the book is something special because it's an interesting read for wide audience. It's comprehensive, it's educational, and it presents really different views as they have evolved during the, uh, during the history of Eurodic. Eurodic started a year after the cyber attacks on Estonia. So when Eurodic came to Tallinn in 2017, for us, it was a really big thing because uh, we were discussing as Uri also said, we were discussing cybersecurity, but we were discussing disinformation. I come from Estonia. Well, needless to say that my country has been for years, tens of years, under of information campaigns, under disinformation. So both cybersecurity, disinformation are crucial for my country and for our e-lifestyle and for our independence. 
What I'd like to underline in this book and in the whole process of, I, by the way, I even looked into the notes. I still have the notes from the 2017 uh, panel where I was together with Kaya from uh, Microsoft. She was then the government cybersecurity policy strategy uh, director with George, who was cybercrime program officer of the Council of Europe and with Sally Wentworth from ISAC. So I still have the notes from that meeting, uh, which means that it was important for me. But what uh, uh, also was important is to see how the discussions, uh, including other stakeholders, have changed. For years, security and cybersecurity, international security, were a domain for states and governments. More wide use of internet and cybersecurity becoming also a politically political priority has changed that attitude. I would argue that for the first time in the history of mankind, states and governments alone can't deal with cybersecurity effectively. They need other stakeholders. And they need other stakeholders not only on paper, not as a politically correct slogan, but also as partners private sector, academia, <laughs> IT sector, industry, different stakeholders. And that makes Eurodic special. Today we have Paris call. Today we have Secretary General's roadmap. Today we have high, high political level global documents that recognize multi-stakeholderism. But I would argue that it would have not happened if Eurodic would have not put their efforts into inclusiveness, into listening to other stakeholders and cooperating with them. If I may suggest one thing uh, for Eurodic for the future, I came from uh, Katowice where I was following the parliamentary track. It's a new track. It was the third time. It was the second time we met face to face. It was introduced uh, in 2019. So maybe also Eurodic needs more, more focused parliamentary track. Because yes, lawmakers have to be educated. Lawmakers do not leave their comfortable uh, comfort zones too easily, but they have to be educated because digital has become horizontal. Internet is horizontal, it's everywhere. So wherever you legislate, you have to take into account also the digital component. So maybe that might be something to think for the future to have also more <laughs> emphasis of new stakeholder group parliamentarians. But to Tatiana, she left, but it's recording, so maybe she will listen later to it. Tatiana, congratulations. It's the first book, looking for the sequel, and I'm sure that the sequel will also come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marina. And um, with pleasure, I pick up the idea of a parliamentarian track. Actually, we try to introduce it at Eurodic uh, more sustainable this year already, but we found out that we had a very bad timing just before the summer break, and we got the same uh, uh, answer from many parliamentarians that they have to uh, do the necessary thing before going into the summer break and could not dedicate really the time for Eurodic. So next year, you might have seen already the dates are again a bit earlier in June. Um, it's almost confirmed. Um, we are looking into the dates of 20th to 22nd of, of June. This is before uh, midsummer, so that's important for the Nordic countries. And uh, hopefully early enough uh, for parliamentarians to uh, be on board. Um, and now I invite everyone um, to uh, answer any question, uh, to ask any questions or give your comments. Um, in the chat, um, there is one comment from, from Joseph Marina. Admire your own cybersecurity. Should we not extend towards societal security the, digi the digital transformation that gives threat to the society with respect to work? Oh, that's a long comment. Um, Marina, you can see this comment too, or maybe um, Joseph, if you would like to take the floor, please feel free to do so. Yeah. First of all, sorry for being late. Uh, the, the comment is around that I see a lot of things happening as, as part of the digital transformation. 
we see hate speech, we see a lot more things than just cyber attacks. The income of the governments are threat because the IT companies walks away with uh, parts of the income. Uh, the power concentration of the big companies and all that is something which we at the University of Oslo put under the header of societal security. And I'm just wondering whether this is the right fora to say, hey, it's not only cyber security, it's also societal security. Any comments, please? Marina, I think that's a good question to you. Uh, well, I am biased. I come from Estonia. We, we have had e-lifestyle for now almost 30 years. E-lifestyle means that uh, internet, ICT, digital revolution has influenced all, all the spheres of society, starting with political leadership, economy, civil society, social questions, everything. Yes, there are new challenges coming, and I absolutely agree. It's not only cyber attacks, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's raising awareness, it's education, uh, but at the same time, we've seen that digital can improve societies. Now, when I, talk, when I think about social questions, I don't know, e-health, one of the things that comes first to my mind. Yes, there are difficult questions concerning privacy. Who owns, who owns data? How to exchange data, data securely? There are also questions of trust. You can't introduce a digital society if there is not enough trust between government, citizens, private sector, government, all the different stakeholders. Yes, there are very many aspects. And for me, digital has become part of society. So we can't say that to all the threats that have occurred in the recent years are also threats to the society. And I completely agree that it's not only cyber, it's not only cyber attacks, but there are many more layers. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a very strong believer in digital being a way of progress and digital uh, as a way of changing for the best. We, if we have challenges, have to tackle them, but should not go back to, 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 to last century developments. And that's why I do not agree with those who are not ready to introduce, for example, online voting, saying that it's less secure than offline. It's not. Nobody has proved. Just the challenges are different. And that way we should see and tackle all the different challenges that our societies have. Thank you. Sorry if, if, I, if, uh, if, I, if I missed the question. Um, I, I don't think you did. I think that was right to the point. And I would like to thank Joseph in particular, uh, because I realized Joseph is in the room, but he logged into the Zoom platform. And that's basically how we can overcome the bridge between online and on-site participants. So Joseph, thank you very much for being so proactive. And I see there is a question in the chat um, from Adeline Brion, and I answered in the chat already, but I want to do it here on the record as well. Um, Adeline is asking how uh, one can contribute to the next Eurodic in June. That's a very good question because at the moment the call for issues is open and I posted the link in the chat, um, but you can also easily find it by visiting eurodic.org and here everyone, every individual and uh, every organization is invited, is invited to submit a proposal and uh, the call for issues is still open until uh, the end of the year on 31st of December. And all these proposals that are submitted will uh, be reviewed by our subject matter expert and will be publicly discussed um, at the beginning of February. We are still hoping to do it as a hybrid meeting, but let's see, it might become a fully online meeting. And um, the call for issues is not uh, as for the IGF that you apply for a workshop, but um, you rather submit just an issue that you think should be discussed and uh, how the org teams and everything is formed comes later in the process. So please feel free to submit your issue without taking any uh, further responsibility at the moment. But of course, in the course of the uh, preparation work, everyone is invited to join this process. I see that uh, Mark Cavell has raised his hand and I would like to ask uh, my colleagues in the room Elizabeth and Thomas to let us know if there are 
questions or comments coming from the room that are not in the in the Zoom chat. But let's give the floor to Mark Cavell first. Yes, uh, thank you, Sandra, and uh, hello, everybody from from UK. And uh, I'm a UADIG member, and um, previously I was um, policymaker with, in the UK government on internet governance, going way back. Uh, and I just wanted to comment with a couple of reflections from the UK about involving parliamentarians, as uh, Marina is, is strongly advocating, and, and I strongly support, because um, from the, I mean, in the UK now, in UK Parliament, we have online safety legislation going through the parliamentary process. You know, it's going into committees, it's going from the House of Commons to the House of Lords, and this, this is top of the agenda, political agenda in the UK. Um, and it covers a whole ro roster of problem areas. Um, you know, child online safety was a big driver for this legislative proposal. But, but in, in recently, it's become even more um, elevated uh, through all the concerns about online hate, hate speech, disinformation and its wider impacts, including its impact on democracy. You know, it's, it's, there are concerns that people are now are not going to step forward to be parliamentarians because they fear the, the hate and threat uh, to, to themselves personally and to their families because they are standing up to, you know, to serve the public as parliamentarians. So it is, it's really, vitally important that these issues are addressed and that the parliamentarians who are discussing this in committees and, and voting on the government's proposals are fully informed that they understand how the internet works and, and, and uh, what the best approach is uh, through st stakeholder consultations, through hearing uh, these issues fully explored uh and and properly informed so that the legislation that results is not going to be uh out of step with technology development that is going to cut across the principles established by the WISIS way back in the beginning and and that that it's it's workable and it'll have the support of all the key actors in industry the technical community rights community uh and, as well as citizens broadly uh as well so um it's it's so important um, to involve parliamentarians, um, and we should we should you know, really look at how UAD can can embrace that. And I, and it's a message coming from the UN Secretary General as well. Um, so that that's that's what I I wanted to say. Uh, and I you know in the past when I was in in the ministry uh, briefing parliamentarians, they said, oh, well, we can't go to the IGF, you know, it's three days out, there are important votes, you know, there's no way I can participate. Uh, and likewise to, to Eurodig. If we were lucky, lucky, we could get a minister to come to Eurodig uh, and, and to the IGF. And we had, in the UK government, ministers who were really committed to the multi-stakeholder model and would do that. Now we're working much more virtually I think there's the opportunity really to get much more parliamentary involvement because they don't have to travel. You know, there isn't the, the opportunity cost of missing parliamentary business. Thanks. I hope those are helpful comments. Thank you, Mark. Maybe a, a comment also from my side. I think <clears throat> um, actually we have tried uh, to, to get parliamentarians involved from the very beginning when we organized uh, the 20, uh, 2009 uh, Eurodig in Geneva at the EBU. Then we had a session with Ms. Troutman on video and some others uh, in, in, uh, physically in 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 in, uh, in Geneva, <clears throat> I think the the positive thing is that with the importance that digital issues and cyber issues gain, also with AI, this is something that I'm witnessing in my country in Switzerland. Parliamentarians, it's not just a few freaks as they were considered like five or ten years ago that are into digital issues, but. It, they more and more realize that this is important. They also realize that most of them don't really know enough. <clears throat> so the attention, we are, we are rising on the attention level. On the other hand, it is a challenge to really get them into uh, the, the, the process because they are overloaded with work. Then on the one hand, um, yeah, the, the hybrid model gives more, gives more opportunities. They don't have to travel. On the other hand, sometimes it's particularly the networking that they are interested in. So 
also there i think we have to play with with both um with the best of both worlds physical and hybrid and um and uh, much of it is communication so that they do understand um what is the value added of 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 being part of such a process because they get hundreds of invitations of conferences and meetings so we need to be probably even better to single out why Eurodig or the UNIGF is is different from all the rest um, because again they, they may not know uh, these processes they may not know what the difference is so um, but I think we really have to concentrate that that should be an important factor and and also of course with people like Marina uh, who is a member of parliament I mean also maybe we could give some references or use you as an ambassador kind of uh, to to put a few words in your mouth or, or have a, a quote from you why this is important for a parliamentarian uh, and things like that that may help so that they see it's not just some bunch of freaks that want to invite them to something but actually there are parliamentarians that can say why they why they like the the process so this is just my my take on this Jacobo you also want to say something yeah yeah I think that the one of the um, element that we had at the very beginning of Eurodig that is now a little bit missed is that we were regularly going to the parliament to report and to have an exchange and um, in the last years also because of the pandemic but even before this um, interaction was missing while I think that is important because Eurodig is uh, a gymnasium where the ideas are exchanged and uh, modified uh, through the interaction that uh, is very useful for the parliament in order to have a, a multi-stakeholder view that can be important to complement um, the view as politicians. So if there is something that um, we can take as good proposal for the next year, we are near to the New Year's proposals, so we can add this to the list for Santa Claus. Thank you, uh, Giacomo and Thomas, for, for um, highlighting again our call for issues. We have, I would say, a Q and operation. Nicola has raised her hand for quite a while, and I also understand that Joseph in the room would take the open mic again. So, Nicola, you are first, and then Joseph, please. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to get back to this societal security issue, the broader issues, not beyond cyber security. And, uh, you know, I mentioned a number of them and also here you mentioned a number of them already. And one is certainly disinformation or, you know, uh, any or hate speech. Of course, it's, 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 it's a terrible issue. And we have heard at IGF a number of discussions, especially about hate speech um, addressed to women parliamentarians, for example, women politicians, and this is, it's, it's, it's horrible when you listen to this, really, it's, it's very frightening. And I can imagine that a lot of women are discouraged to even take this job because they fear this and, and they fear for their families, not for themselves only. So uh, these issues are very serious and they need to be addressed. And uh, I think there's a combination of things which needs to be done. One is certainly is regulation. I mean, platforms need to take more responsibility about these issues. And when it's illegal contact and hate speech is, is illegal <laughs> normally, then they should really address this and they should not let it go. And just saying, you know, there is so much of them, of, of, of it is not a good excuse. They have uh, wonderful algorithms to do a lot of things. So I'm sure they can also deal with that but it needs to be complemented by human intervention, not only algorithm. Uh, and they need to take more responsibility also for this information. This is not always illegal, but still it can create problems uh, as we have seen around the pandemic. And so it needs to be addressed. They need to be accountable. They need to take responsibility to deal with these issues. That's very clear. And they need to be reminded <laughs> again and again to do this. And I think this multi-stakeholder uh, forum is a good place to do it. Um, and then um, about the, the involvement of parliamentarians, and it's great to have Marina here. I was very active for many years in the European Internet Forum, uh, and they have, uh, uh, they always deal also with the, with, with, the, with the IGF and Eurodig, so they are involved, and it's a good forum, and maybe that sh we should look at this again, how to use it better maybe in the future to involve parliamentarians. Uh, 
uh, but it's 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 a good group of people who are interested in in digital um, uh, policy, digital aspects of all kinds, going nowadays really across the different uh, sectors. Also, it started very much to be internet, you know, technical access focused, but nowadays all sectors, as rightly was said by many people, are covered by this. So. Uh, yes, I think we should go back to them also and see what we can do uh, to involve them better in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. And now, uh, Joseph, please take the mic in the room. The, the topic I'd like to address is the topic of digital inclusion. Uh, it's not really the story for us, Marina, in the, in the North. Uh, when I talk with uh, our folks at the N8, the Nordic Editech, then inclusion isn't really the topic. But when I when I talk to Josh Pereira by the to the EU Commission and I talk about what is about broadband, what is about access to information, and what about the social component in Europe to actually claim that everyone in Europe should have free access to information on the internet which is a layer on, uh, which could be a layer on the internet. Because what I'm always asking myself, why do I need a mobile broadband subscription to find out where the, when the next bus is going or where the map of the, uh, the streets are? Thank you, Joseph. Um, you basically open up a lot of uh, interesting topics uh, that could feed into the call for issues. And I would like to invite you in particular to use that opportunity and submit such questions to the uh, call for issues, because I fear we don't have the time today to go in depth to, to all these questions, but definitely worth discussing them. Uh, um, are there any other comments or questions on, on this two uh, topics that we have touched upon now? Um, um, uh, Elizabeth Thomas, is there somebody in the room who would like to take the floor? I, I see think no one. No, I don't okay. think so. <laughs> if you want to uh, take the floor, now is your last chance. But I don't see any movement, so I guess we're good for now. Okay. I see also no one in the chat. But um, let me take that opportunity to make two announcements. First announcement is, um, I said it already at the beginning, um, from the categories that uh, we have at Eurodic uh, that we have predefined in order to shape our program, the next category will look into the development of the internet governance system uh, back to a decade. And Mark Cavell, who is here also with us, is the author, and he is just very, very busy with writing this report. Um, uh, and the first draft uh, will be seen by the end of the year, so you can expect the publication to come out early next year. And since it's the core of Eurodic, the European Dialogue on Internet Governance, um, I think that will be a key brochure. <laughs> and um, we will definitely do a Eurodic extra session or something like this uh, to introduce this publication. Mark, um, do you would like to share a few thoughts and words on, on this publication as well? Yes, uh, okay, thanks, Sandra. Yes, it's in the course of preparation, as they say. Um, and a de decade of change, but it's a decade of evolution and uh, maturity and also further evolution, if you like. It's how I kind of characterize the history as I, I recount in the, uh, in the, in the next um, uh, publication. Um, I mean, the, the, if you go back to the early days, uh, it was, I mean, we tend to forget, but it was a very experimental period. I remember, you know, I was involved in setting up the, the first UK national forum. It was one of the first, I think uh, we like to say, at the national level and uh, you know well how do we do it you know what do, you know it was pretty sort of uh, and we had a minister who thought okay let's let's try it see if it works you know it's that kind of approach um and and since then of course uh it's become part of uh the life of the internet to have multi-stakeholder process and multi-stakeholder discussion at, at the global level, led by by uh, the outcomes from the WISIS, and that helped define the approach that could be taken at the uh, regional level, UDIG, and at, and at the national level. So we've seen these um, uh, uh, for uh, proliferate across the world, and I forget the numbers now, but it's something like 120 plus national 
IGF, the Indian IGF has just started, which is great news. So anyway, going back to this, this publication, it will cover how uh, the multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance has evolved at the European level through, through Eurodig, how um, the scope of it and the kind of issues it's, it's uh, engaged with. It won't go into in detail on, on too much uh, of specific issues, but it, I will try to convey how the scope of the forum has changed. It was very much um, focused on some critical issues in the early days, like net neutrality and the domain name system and future of ICANN and the IANA stewardship transition. So you had those very specific um, issues which were you know, capturing a lot of attention in internet governance uh, circles, quite rightly. Um, but since then, you know, it's, it's evolved into a much broader, what we'd like to say now is a digital agenda. So I will try to illustrate how that's happened and how UDIG has intersected with some of the key milestones uh, that have, have taken place over the last, um, uh, what, what is it now, it's 12, 13 years. Um, uh, we will, you know, I will try to, to illustrate that and how this forum has been uh, influential, how, how through articulating broad consensus, uh, it's actually exerted influence and been a channel for European stakeholders in particular to, to connect with, uh, with, uh, with the global issues in, in, the, in the IGF itself. Uh, and you know, the, the whole development of outcomes as messages, I think was a great move by, by Yurdi, which um, has been now picked up really as a, as a model for other multi-stakeholder fora, which like, like Yurdi are not negotiating fora, we're not negotiating treaties or, or uh, regulations, but we are, articulating well this is the, these are the options these are the key points that came out of uh, discussions in the european forum and how the forums become more much more diverse we've just been talking about parliamentarians but you know engaging young people this has been an important part of the whole Eurodig agenda again an exemplar for other multi-stakeholder process um so quite a lot to cover <laughs> Uh, and uh, a lot, quite a lot to to, um, to to illustrate by example, but also to to anticipate further change. And um, I'll spend quite a lot of time on the current um, uh, move stimulated by the Secretary General of the UN uh, with the Digital Cooperation Roadmap uh, to strengthen the IGF, and and that involves the interconnect with. The national and regional IGFs, there's no doubt about it, uh, and, and how we can move from um, uh, a, a, an event approach, event based approach, which UTEC has already done. You know, we've got now extra events, we're responding as a European forum in an agile way to key issues, em emerging. Uh, um, proposals that might be coming out at the moment, largely from the digital corporation. We may see the leadership panel of the IGF stimulate opportunities for Eurodig to focus quickly on a specific uh, strategic proposal, if you like, for, for governance. So the roadmap and, and how a regional fora like Eurodig, I hope, will contribute to the digital compact at the global level uh, will be will be important, and how also we relate to local communities as a European forum uh, through the national fora, uh, the UK IGF, uh, French IGF, NL IGF, whatever you know. That interconnection is going to be an important move for the future, and I will. Uh, these are the kind of points that uh, will come out in in the pub publication as we look ahead and implementation of the roadmap. So I've gone on a great length and they were short of time, but I hope that's, that gives a flavor of what uh, uh, I'm covering in the publication. Thanks. It gives Actually, indeed, uh, it gives indeed, uh, Mark, and uh, thank you for working on it. And um, if someone has uh, resources to make possible the next publications, we are looking into human rights, uh, innovation and economic issues, but also technical and operational issues are yet to come. And uh, we, we are looking basically for supporters to, uh, for sponsors, we need money. Let's put it short. And um, I heard that um, 
uh, there is a red light already in the room um, and that we have to finish our session soon. Let me uh, just announce, uh, announce, and I said it already briefly, that we would like to do our Eurodic planning uh, beginning of February. Um, we are still planning for a hybrid meeting, a two days meeting in Trieste, in the uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics, where we will use one day to draw our conclusions from the hybrid IGF, from the virtual Eurodics, and how we would like to um, develop our, uh, our, our meeting this year. I'm pretty sure we will meet in, partly in person in June this year. And um, I'm not sure if we can meet in person in February, but we are planning. And the second day will be used to go through the call for proposals that we received until the 31st of December. And that will be the usual uh, uh, procedure uh, on drafting the program, which is then open for comment and on which then the community will start building um, the uh, the, the, the session itself. And I see Thomas has put on his, his mouth. Yes. Cover. So, Thomas, I give you the last word, and I would like to thank everyone uh, contributing to that session. Yes, thank you, Sandra. Just one last word. Also, Valma Marina is here. Um, since you were talking about funding, you may know that Eurodig is operating on a very, very tiny budget. And thanks to uh, uh, lots of heart and efficiency, we managed to somehow organize what we do with this budget. But we would be really, uh, this is just an urge to everybody, whenever you have ideas on how to get additional funding, and of course, if, if whatever you talk to VIPs or people that have uh, some money in their pockets, raise the issue, ask them to support Euridic, because we know that people like and appreciate the process and, and sometimes it's just forgotten and, and, and people don't really think that they could actually also contribute to the funding because uh, the more money we get, the more the more quality we can deliver and the more we can do what people expect. So that's, again, my, as usual, my usual call. Please join the donors. Uh, it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And to make it easy, there is also a donate button on the Eurodic website where uh, even small donations would really help if uh, they come from, from many people. A lot of many small money makes big money at the end. So thank you very much and enjoy uh, the rest of the meeting in Katowice and the rest of the day. And it was a pleasure seeing you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.